Hey, man, you know what it is, man. Hebron Ben Bilal coming back at you with them Backyard Chronicles again. Man, today I want to talk about this classroom chaos that's sweeping y'all country, that's sweeping y'all society. How you can eliminate it, why it doesn't affect the Hebrew Israelite communities, and also how it is a derivative or derives or it is a byproduct of the whole feminist movement. But before we get into that, man, you know what it is, man. He brought Ben Malau coming back at you with them Backyard Chronicles again. So tell a friend to tell a friend that he brought Ben Malau is back with those Chronicles again, saying what you would love to say, but you're just too PC to say it. If you haven't went to the page, man, and, and subscribe, do that now. You can see what it looks like when you get to my YouTube page. That's exactly what it's going to be set up like. Um, we have more than 18 subscribers. I just got that old thing up there. My wife will fix it. But... Yeah, man, um, go to the page, subscribe, man, I'm trying to get those uh, subscription, those subscribers up. All Hebrews should be on here because this is what we do. We talk about outside topics, what's going on in their society, and then we kind of bring it back to our culture and explain why we don't practice this and, and, and how our structure and order keeps us uh, away from these things. But man, without further ado, let's jump into this, man. This whole <laughs> chaos in the classrooms is an epidemic in y'all communities, man, and it is out of control. And like I said, I want to show you why it's a byproduct and how, how and why it is a byproduct uh, of this whole feministic movement, how it came about. Um, but before we do that, man, I want to show you four videos and I want you to watch the videos and then stop, take a breath and tell me which of these four videos is most repulsive to you. What of these four videos is most repulsive to you? We're gonna start with this cat here. Uh, jumps on this little jumps on this little teacher. We're gonna start with him. that will shock and anger you. A teacher shoved and tossed to the ground by a student nearly twice her size during a fight over a cell phone. New tonight, Local 2's Jennifer Bauer spoke with that teacher and joins us live. Jen? You know, Dominique, we did speak with that teacher and she didn't want to go on camera. We respected her wishes because she's been through so much. The district tells us she is very shaken by everything that happened. A classroom confrontation caught on camera. Watch as the student in the red shirt pushes the teacher once, twice, then a third push sends her to the ground backwards. And new tonight, we're getting a look at the confrontation from another angle. Police are using these videos, most of them posted to the social media site Instagram, to investigate the incident. They tell us the student, a six foot three, 325 pound 16 year old, has been charged with injury to the elderly. Police say he was upset because the teacher tried to take his cell phone away. Students tell Local 2 she left in a neck brace and was taken to the hospital. We spoke to her and she tells us she is fine, she's at home, and resting. People who have seen this video are outraged and they're talking about it online. On Facebook, someone wrote, wow, it's getting worse and worse. These kids don't have any respect for anybody anymore. And another person said, this is awful. The students cheering are just as bad as the students shoving the teacher. It, it upset me. Most people were laughing. I didn't. I didn't find it funny. You, you can't just go and push on her like that. And that student's name has not been released because he's. All right. Let's check out this second video. This Texas kid and what he does to his teacher. It's a quick video. Go get him, go get him. Bro, give me my phone. Put my right here and give me this, fam. Damn! Yes, sir. This is y'all. Let me say this. 
This is y'all society. This is y'all nation, man. And uh, once again, I'm going to show you why this is a direct byproduct um, of the feminist movement, how you can eliminate it, and why it doesn't exist in Hebrew Israelite communities. Let's get to the next two videos I wanted to show you guys. And once again, tell me which one of these infuriates you the most. Which one of them is the most deplorable to you? Texas teacher under arrest for assault after cell phone video emerged showing a brutal classroom attack on a sophomore student. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details, and we do want to warn you, this footage is disturbing. Alyssa, look! Tonight, a violent moment inside a Texas classroom going viral. As a result, the community demanding answers after authorities say this substitute teacher was seen on video unleashing a vicious attack on this 16-year-old student, throwing a flurry of punches, then dr dragging the teen to the ground, finally stomping on her head. That teacher, 32-year-old Tiffany Lankford, now charged with aggravated assault. A student in the class saying Lankford had become increasingly agitated at the Spanish language class, eventually closing in on the victim. The student swung because she was in her face and pressing her. The immediate onslaught that followed, leaving the student wailing on the ground. Oh, I was just sort of like stuck. I didn't know how to react. The student's attorney says she has epilepsy. The school district says Lankford did pass a background check when they hired her in August, adding there is absolutely no excuse or circumstance that can justify what you see unfold on the video. The school district has now fired this teacher. She was arrested Friday on school grounds, but has since... Okay, let's get to the next one. And the last one. This one here is a favorite of mine. There is outrage following a very disturbing video out of a North Carolina middle school. Gotta warn you, this is really tough to watch. Take a look. A school resource officer is caught slamming a student to the ground twice. Oh, God. Yes, he then yanks the student up before dragging him down the hallway. So this happened last Thursday at Vance County Middle School. The officer has been placed on paid leave pending an investigation by the state. The school district says it is fully cooperating with the investigation. The way that officer should be able to come back. And the thing about it, Vlad, is the student is so little. Yeah. He is so little. I... Student is so little. All right, man. Let me ask you all, first of all, who, what, what, what did you think? Which one is the most deplorable to you? Is it all four? Is it just two? Is it one in particular? Um, which one offended you the most? Now, I'm going to say this for sure, for sure, that the majority of you women, the ones on which would be the right, offended you the most. Seeing those children, uh, that lady brutally attacking that little girl, poor little girl, she had epilepsy, um, and then seeing that uh, uh, security guard slam quarters out that little boy pocket twice and i already know what y'all saying oh there's no justifiable reason for them to do that and that's wrong and but just hold on take a pause take a breath take a pause and take a breath because we're going to take a little deeper dive into this particular situation i'm going to show you why it's an epidemic and these are just not isolated incidences and then i'm going to show you why this never occurred Back when I was in school, I'm 47. Back when I was in school, this never, ever occurred. But first, I want to get to this. And let's take a look at this. And let's see how exactly how the school system is combating this epidemic. And then we're just going to take a deep dive and we're going to break it all the way down for you. So let's get this one on. It's six minutes, so just... Let's just watch it together. Classrooms trashed, children so disruptive, teachers are forced to take extreme measures. It is a nationwide problem, and it's impacting school districts all around the St. Louis area. News 4 investigator Chris Negus explains why more teachers are dealing with the chaos in the classroom 
and why parents aren't being kept in the loop. I just felt like I was kind of drowning. That's how Margaret Powers describes her final year of teaching in the Hazelwood School District. After seven years of teaching, behavior issues at the elementary level pushed her to say enough. That was two years ago. Tearing things apart, walking on top of the desks and on the tables and hitting kids. And I mean, all those kinds of things happened like way, way too regularly. Is this one of the reasons why you ultimately quit? It was a driving factor, yeah. She documented the curse words drawn on desks aimed at other kids. Children lying on the floor refusing to follow directions. Even young kids tearing up homework assignments in her face. And in some cases, much worse. I know somebody who had a concussion from a kid cracking a clipboard over their head. A teacher. Their teacher. The kid took a clipboard and took it to their head. And she had a concussion and she was gone for several days. And that was while you were there? Oh, yeah. And she remembers something else, a situation where one child's behavior was so disruptive, she removed the well-behaved kids from the classroom to keep them safe. He would tear apart the classroom. I did evacuate the classroom several times in that year. And what do you mean by that, evacuate the classroom? He was doing, he was behaving in a way that scared me for the safety of my students um, and myself, but mostly my students. And so I safely removed them from the classroom because he wasn't responding to any cues or requests or anything else. So I wanted them away from him. The other students? Yes. Stories of classrooms getting cleared might surprise parents, but it doesn't surprise teachers. Power's story isn't obvious. unique. Is the job of a teacher harder today than it was just five years ago or 10 years ago? Absolutely. Pat McPartland is the president of the union that represents teachers in the Parkway District. Is it that we need to, as you alluded to before, do we need to evacuate a classroom because when the student acts up, we need to make sure that they are safe and other kids are safe. And does that happen? Hey, well, let me pause this real quick. The question was that he asked, was being a teacher easier five years ago versus what it is today? And I know a lot of y'all are saying, man, he, he looks tired. No, I'm not tired. It's just my wife told me before I came on, she said, look, calm your storm, because this particular issue pisses me off beyond measure. And I'm going to use some expletives in this video, but please bear with me. And there's no way that this video is going to be able to be short because of the dive we're going to take into this uh, topic. Um, there's nothing funny about this at all. Five years ago, it was easier to be a school teacher. And I'm going to explain why in just a second. But um, they have enacted a program to combat this bad behavior. Now, she said this particular child, this kid, over the course of the school year, at least four times, he cut up so bad that they had to evacuate the entire class four times in one year. And this is how they counteract this behavior. By emptying out the classroom whenever this dude, this kid, he wants to cut up like this to this degree. It starts at home. That's first. Let's just get that out the way. It starts at home first. Um, I can guarantee he comes from a single parent home. And they said they, they combat this by emptying out the classroom. And I want to magnify that. And I want to make sure that I put a pin in it and that you really pay attention to what these people are saying. Let's get back to the video. Yes. Uh, in rare circumstances. But yeah, it, it, it could be part of a behavior intervention plan. Those plans offer teachers guidance. In the Parkway District, approximately 1% of the students follow one. That's 200 out of the 17,000 kids. At what point does that child who's misbehaving, at what point does his right to have the classroom cleared override the right of the kids who want to learn? That is an outstanding question, and I think that that's a, a dilemma. News 4 asked multiple area districts how many students are on behavior intervention plans. In the Ladue district, it's approximately 1% of the student body. That's similar to Parkway. In Belleville and East St. Louis, it's approximately 3%. The Fox School District, less than 1%. These numbers might not sound high, but districts are dealing with increased behavior challenges. And that's why the Parkway District recently convened a mental health task force to deal with rising social and emotional. Two things real quick. First, do you see that? They are creating a mental health task force because they're saying 
that your black children are out of control. They have no idea what to do with them. They don't know how to deal with them. Um, behavioral issues, they set up this uh, program to combat the behavioral issues and this is what they came up with. They created a mental health task force. See, let me say this. First and foremost, if you noticed, each and every one of these teachers that they were talking to, administrators, uh, the ones on the other page um, who were getting jumped on, the old white lady, uh, the old white man who got mugged over the phone um, and threatened by the young man, um, all these particular teachers, they're all white. I'm not bringing race, racism into this. I'm not about to be screaming at all that uh, institutional racism. I'm not, man. I, that that they everybody attaches hitch their wagon to that, and now that's coming to catchphrase for everything. Everything under the sun is about institutional racism. I'm just so tired of that, man. But anyway, I digress on that particular point. And I get to the point. Here's the situation. You have white people trying to educate, discipline, and mold and shape the identity of black children. Black children, black young children are so much different than white children. Emotionally, it's intellectually, spiritually, they are so much different. So when you have white teachers, white administrators, white people who govern over these inner city schools, they have no idea about how difficult a task that they are about to undertake. Whereas a black administration, a black teacher, they understand the dynamics of dealing with a black child when they go in because they understand aggression has to be met with aggression. And a lot of you recoiled at the slamming of the young black man, the young little, little kid. Many of you recoiled from seeing that lady uh, tee off on that little girl. And we're going to get back to that. But me, no, sir. Absolutely not. Um, the young the young boy, he probably should have been slammed a third time. Um, a lot of you would say that there's nothing that that young boy could have did to have deserved that. Sure it is. Even if he spoke out of turn, even if he spoke out of turn in a disrespectful manner, he needed that. Because ultimately, it takes that pressurization of what I call the male gene. I created a thing. Uh, I call it the male gene. And if it's not cultivated and pressurized in young black men, this is what you get. You get out of control young black men who will challenge authority at every level that will cut up, act out defiantly. And it takes that pressurization. It takes that interaction with a black man to say, oh, no, 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 no. This is why you had when the interviewers or the uh, the people in the news were saying, oh, he was so little. That means nothing. He was so little. But if that same joker goes in and cuts up in the classroom, you're going to evacuate the whole classroom. No, that's not the way to deal with this issue. Torah tells you how to deal with the issue, but we'll get to that in a minute. And and it's a reason why these behaviors do not exist in Israelite communities. And we will get to that in a minute. Now, I want to bring it to uh, the feministic movement because you have to understand that these behaviors are birthed out of the single parent home. No, no, no. There is no male in a household unless he's so pen uh, 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 henpecked and pee whooped until he allows that woman to run that household. There is no man, man, M A N, not henpecked. Uh, male man that is going to sit idly by and allow his son to conduct himself like that there's no way and I want to take you into this thing that like I say once again um, in regard to the male gene if the male gene I created this thing that all men and I wrote about it that all men are born with a gene that young women don't have especially young black men. I can't speak for white students. I can't speak for them. Um, 
they're born with what I deem or uh, uh, the male gene. And if this male gene is not pressurized and cultivated by another man, pressurized meaning challenging him, meeting him at that point of challenge, then it turns into what I call red dust. Red dust is confusion, chaos, answers that are not questions, uh, questions that are, have not been answered. Why do I feel like this? Why do I feel like that? Why am I doing this? Why am I acting out like that? I need that challenge in my life and it's not being met. And this is why you have these white teachers who cannot control these young black males. But when you seen that sister there, when she left teed off on that girl, I wish I had a school because I go give her and give her a job. Because I understand she's going to keep order in that classroom and it's never going to be an instance where there's somebody going to have to evacuate that classroom because she's going to meet them at that point of attack. But understand that she was dealing with a female and I appreciate that fact. Um, <clears throat> and also, if you listen to the video, uh, the young man that they were speaking to said, oh, the teacher was all up in her face and that's why she swung on her. And we're going to get back to that statement as well. But let's deal with the male gene. The male gene is something innate that all young black men are born with. And I'm going to tell you how I know this for a fact. I have a son. He's autistic. My son functions on a 13 or 14 uh, year old level, even though he's 23. And when I was in prison, um, last time I was incarcerated, my wife had him, uh, of course, and she was raising him up. And just before I came home from prison, she emailed me and told me to get in touch with her. So I got in touch with her. And I called her. I said, hey, what's going on? And she told me about an encounter that her and my son had had. What had happened was my, my wife had refused him something that he wanted. And he had become very aggressive. First, he started uh, to talk back to her. But this had been progressively growing. And she told me I had been seeing the progression of it before this encounter. So she said that he uh, was refused something that he wanted. So he started talking back to her aggressively and moving towards her with an, 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 an aggressive fashion that scared her. And she said just instinctually because of the aggression that he was showing her that, he sh that she slapped him to kind of try to back him down. She said he held his face for one, about a second and went to swing at her and missed and she said she backed away and he grabbed her and they got to tussling. Now understand he was born in a household where there was no males. There's no women, there's nothing but women in my wife's side of family except for her uh, brother. And um, so he never had that pressurization. He never had that alpha over him. So I told her, I said, listen, as soon as I get home, I'll deal with that. And I said, you have to back off and allow me to deal with it. Now understand, He's not my first rodeo. So understand, I've raised young black men from my nephews to my sons to uh, uh, young men in the neighborhoods that I came up in. And I also watched and understood how and learned from how the men ahead of me did me. And this is how I was able to implement this pressurization process in regard to my children, my nephews, and as well as my autistic son. So when I got home and my autistic son and his mother moved in with me, um, I told her, I said, listen, you're going to have to back off when this goes down. Cause it's going to go down. Cause I seen how he used to interact with her. I said, it's going to go down. I said, and when it goes down, you're going to have to back off. Now, a lot of you going to say, I know you didn't put your hands on your autistic son. No, I didn't. I didn't have to. Pressurization comes in different levels. It's discipline, but I call it pressurization. Um, so one day my son was back, he was talking back to his mother. And I got up and I went in the room and I told, you know, hey, look, check this out, uh, homeboy. You ain't, 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 there ain't none of that going on in here. And understand, he understands. He comprehends. He has he comprehends well. Um, and I explained to him. And I said, like, next time, yeah, me, me and you in the back room. So she intervened. Automatically she intervened. And this is why. I'm going to get to the point about the uh, feministic movement. She intervened and she told me, no, see, you can't do him like that. And, this movement. and she's doing this right in front of him, right in front of him, conveying to a 14 year old that no matter what I do, 
she's always going to be there and be that safe haven for me. So I can cut up. And as soon as this dude approaches me, I got that safe haven. See, children have to be young. Black men have to be raised and reared in an environment where they have no safety. They are meant to and they are forced to comply. So with this instance, I said, come here, took it to the side. And I said, check this out. When I'm doing my thing, stay out the way because you are conveying to him that no matter what his behavior is, that it's OK. So she agreed. We had another blow up in the house. And I had to take him to the side and I said, yo, check this out, man. And this is when I became more aggressive. And I got in his face, never physical, got in his face and let him know in no uncertain terms. And I used certain optics and certain language that would express to him that, look, next time you overstep this bound, I got you. Once again, she intervened. So I told her politely, hey, check this out. First, it's only one male in this house. One man, one man. That's me. Two men don't run this house. He's not going to dictate and determine what goes on in this house. I am the man of this house. He listens to me. You listen to me. Now, if you can't stay out the way while I put him in his place, you need to get him and y'all need to go because he's not going to dictate the tempo of this house. So she agreed. So we had two more blow ups. One, I told him to do something directly. She was at work. I told her, told him to do something directly. Look, go and do this, this, and this. So he was dragging his feet doing it, but he did it. So I guess he went in the room and he thought about it for a while or whatever. And he came back out the room. And I'm talking about, man, when he stepped to me, he stepped to me like he was getting ready to put paws on me. It caught me off guard so badly that I, all I could do was just stand there and look at him for a second. I said, I know this just didn't happen. And I reacted, didn't put my hands on him. I took my finger and put it in his chest and I pushed him back to the wall and I cornered him in the, in, the, in the corner. And I met him with that same aggression, but I trumped it up. I rocketed it up. And I asked him, I said, little nigga, what's happening? What, you, you ready now? What's, what's happening? What's going on? Took my shirt off. What's happening? And I let him know in no uncertain terms, I will break you into multiple pieces in this house. I don't, I don't care what you're suffering from. You're going to respect me. You're going to respect these rules and you're going to do exactly what I tell you. And she called. It was frantic and she was really worried about him. So when she came home, she explained to him. She said, look, you've got to listen to him. He's your father. Now, that's a very important part of this whole overall dynamic because both parents have to be on the same page. There can never be a safe haven for the young black male. He has to understand that he is going to be forced to comply to that man. So if he tries to run to the mother, the mother going to let him know, man, look, go on somewhere, do what your father tells you. Now he understands the concept of no safe haven from this, this dude, this monster, this animal. So this is where the pressurization process starts. So after I did that to my autistic son, he fell instantly in line because he understood and I stayed on him, I stayed on him, I stayed on him. Every day I was in his room in his face, get up, get out here, do this, do that. And I pressurized it to the point we have no problems. She tells me today, I cannot believe the difference in this kid, man. He does exactly what you tell him to do, exactly when he's supposed to do it. You set up a schedule, he run, he goes by that schedule, he does everything out of fear for you. You call him, he runs to you. That's that pressurization process. See, a lot of you females, you get in the way of that. Now, when you're in a single woman house, and this is where the feminist movement came into place, because you all felt like you could raise young black men into men, young, young males into men. But you can't. You can't create that pressurization process. You cannot present that challenge that only another man can present, because he is just like my son, who is autistic understood at a certain time when he got to smell himself, he seen that he towered over his mother. He's way taller than her. He's just a little bit shorter than me. And when he grabbed her, she said, he is so strong, there's nothing I could do with him. I was so afraid. He could physically hurt her at any moment. But I am that alpha in the way of that, challenging him at every step of the way. And this is what these young men are missing. They're missing that challenge. 
and not just that challenge, that physical challenge. See, there has to be that fear there. And I told you before about my son, Anthony, my oldest boy, who wrote me when I was incarcerated talking about how dramatically fearful he was of me to the point that whenever I would come over and I stay for a while with his mother, that he would become physically sick because he was that fearful of me. And that is the fear that these young men are missing. And most most you women who are nurturers are sitting there listening to this and saying, oh, no, they should never fear their father like that. Yes, they should. Because it creates that environment that makes them understand that there are limits to your conduct. There's only there's a fence around you, Holmes, and that fence is electric. And every time you touch that fence, it's going to shock you. And that shock is going to be this. See, what they are missing is they're missing that pressurization. See, a lot of you have heard the phrase that it takes a village. And this is truly what Israelites do. The whole village participates in raising a child. See, it doesn't just fall to the parent. There are others involved. Those are outside. They are uh, intricate. And the rearing of the child. The child is a direct reflection, not only of that home, but of the Israelite community at large. And when when you women started to proclaim and believe in your heart that number one, you didn't need a man, and number two, that you could raise young, young black men, you brought the nurturing into place. And without that balance of discipline and nurturing, you, you're gonna have this. Because see, every time that your child does something, you're going to go to bat for that child because as a nurturer, that's what you do. That's why when you seen that video of that young boy getting slammed, uh, instantly, it was nothing that he could have said or done that could have warranted that. Yes, it is. When you're dealing with a black man, especially as a child, and you speak to him a certain way, you bring out that nature in him. That boy said something. He said something. That man, that, that that was not an unwarranted attack. I don't care what you say. Oh, you don't know. And he's just probably, okay, there's stuff that randomly happens and there are exceptions to the rules. But I do not believe that this was one of those instances that was just random and, uh, you know, arbitrarily. He just, just, uh, just jumped on this boy. That's ridiculous to even assume that. But you will have some who will say that. Um, now, uh, uh, as far as once again, the young lady goes, I 100 percent agree with what she did. That young lady, when that up, when that child put her hands on her and they made sure that they pointed out the fact that, oh, she has epilepsy. I wouldn't give a damn if she had a uh, sepilepsy. I don't even know what that is. If you raise your hand to an adult as a child. On a, a, a superior. And I know a lot of you women say, oh, no, 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 you never had no, well, don't put your hands on my kids. And this is the message that you have now given to the child. Because at every turn, let's check this out. See, y'all were all for getting those out of school. See, when I came up, you went into certain classrooms knowing that you had to carry yourself a certain way. Because, man, look, you had teachers that would throttle you behind with that pattern. So when y'all remove corporal punishment, which y'all call it out of the schools, this is what happened. Now you have people who are now, these young men who are now, they're not scared. They don't have, it's, it's, it's not a challenge. I can do whatever I want to do. Now you have this influx of white teachers coming into these schools. And that really creates a whole nother dynamic for them where now they're bringing in their itinerary and saying, look, this is how you got to treat the kids and do this and do that. And you evacuate the class if you get to acting up and all that. See, that 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 right there, that would have solved all that. You understand what I'm saying? But you don't want this. So with the feminist movement, with the I can raise children on my own, I don't need a man mentality, you opened up Pandora's box when it came to the young black male. Because if he is not challenged by that alpha male, understand once he reaches the age of puberty, 12, 13, 14, that's when he's going to get to trying. That's when the back talk is going to happen. And pretty soon it might get physical with you, as it did with my son and, and my uh, my wife. But as you, uh, like I told you, he complies now. It's not even a thought in his head to raise his voice, to deny, or not to act out exactly on what she tells him to do. Because he understands that at the end, 
is going to be my foot. So as I promised, let's get into why Israelite communities don't suffer from these things. Number one, Israelite communities have structure and order. The order is as such. You have Yahweh, you have Yeshua, if those who believe in Yeshua, if you don't believe in Yeshua, remove Yeshua. You have Yahweh, you have the man, you have the woman, and then you have the children in that order. And that man is the head and what he says goes at the bottom at the end of the day. But see, a lot of you women don't like order. You want all, all everything to be a gray area so you can conduct yourself the way that you want to conduct yourself. He can conduct himself the way that he wants to conduct himself. There's no rules, order or discipline. There's no structure. And these right here are the rules and order and structure and discipline that comes with raising a, a, a child on any level, a male child, female child. Um, first, I want to read, and it's kind of small, so if you want to open up your Bible and read along with me. And we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 18 through 21, and we're reading from the King James Version. And we're going to start at 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that they, and that, and that when they chastened him or punished him, will not hearken unto them. Let's stop right there because, see, once again, they show that order. He will not listen to the voice of who? His father first, because the father's the head. And he won't even listen to his mother. And he's rebellious. He's stubborn. They gave you all the criteria in regard to. This child ultimately being put to death, that he's stubborn. Um, and even after he was chastened, even after he was punished, because understand there are rules in regard to us having to punish our children. We go to Proverbs 13, 24, and it says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son's soul, hate, hateth his son. But he that loves him will chasten him uh, uh, many times or quickly. Um, Proverbs 19 and 18 says, Ch uh, chastise or punish your son while there is hope and let not your soul spare for his crime. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14, withhold not correction from the child, for if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. You will beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 29 and 15, the rod of and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother shame. I'm going to deal with that one first, because this is what you have in your society, because you cannot discipline this child, and you won't discipline them. Um, they remove the ability or the option for you guys to discipline your children. So with that understanding, what this proverb, that y'all are supposed to believe this book, what this proverb says, this proverb says, if you do not do it, if he's left alone without these beatings to get his behind in line, then he's going to bring you shame. And this is what you're getting right now. This is the blueprint right here. If you ever got an issue in your culture or society, check this out. We got the blueprint right here. So this is telling you that if you don't do these things above, if you don't beat that kid, if you spare the rod, He's going to be an idiot at the end of the day. Withhold not correction for your child. For if you beat him with the rod, he ain't going to die. And see, this is why we don't have these issues in the Israelite community, because we implement these things early on. And the whole village is responsible. I hear people talking about all the time. Oh, yeah, I, I, I roll raised up in a community, man, where anybody could whoop you. This is what this is explaining to you. Do not spare him at any turn. He has to be a, a reprimand. He has to be reproved. He has to do this and you will deliver his soul from hell because you're teaching him a lesson. Chasing your son while there is still hope and let not your soul, let not your soul spare for his crime. Just because he's crying, don't let it get to you. Keep putting your foot in his butt because you're saving his life ultimately. Is there a path for these young men that we're seeing today to get back on the path of righteousness and to get back? Yes, absolutely. Stick them in any Hebrew Israelite. Take your son if you want to and stick him in any Hebrew Israelite community. Anywhere. And boy, listen, 
that there at the 12 months, I guarantee you, if you don't, if you don't answer his calls, you don't come get him, that you just say, listen, this is what you need. Them Hebrews, oh yeah, yeah. He won't, he won't push another old lady now. He won't go up and, and threaten the teacher and mug him in his face ever again. I guarantee you that fear and that pressurization process will be complete by these Hebrews. And this is the only way that you can get them back on that path. Um, let's get back to this because Deuteronomy uh, 21 is very telling. It says in 19, it says, then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him unto the elders of the city and into the gate of his place. Now, check this out. It didn't say let the mother grab hold of him or let the father grab hold of him because they're both in the home. It said, let them both, the father and the mother. So they have to be in agreement. They have to be one mind on this, that this kid is out of control and we can't deal with him. So now we just, we, we have to do what's best, not only for our safety, but for the community. Because if you allow these retarded, bastardized kids to keep going into these institutions without being pro properly uh, pressurized, this is what you get. Man, those schools are unsafe for anybody, any kid. I would never put my child in, in a place like that. It says, both of you take him and you take him to the elders of the city. Remember, I told you, Israelite communities, man, look, the whole community is responsible for making sure that things run correctly. It says, take him to the city, uh, uh, to the gates of the city where the elders is at. And say unto the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn, number one, he's stubborn, and rebellious, number two, and he will not obey our voices, number three. These are all three things that this, this kid is doing. He is a glutton and he's a drunkard. So nine times out of ten, I'm going to tell you this. First, those kids on the video, they're stubborn. They're rebellious. They showed all the characteristic traits. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. They will not listen. Those are three. And I can guarantee that they're on some type of substance. I can guarantee it. Whether it's weed, alcohol, whatever it is, they're on some peel, perks, mollies, whatever. And they're gluttons. Now, if all of these criteria are met, and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he died, that kid, so that you put the evil away from amongst you. And all of Israel shall hear and fear. And I'm going to cap this thing off with this, with that particular passage. All the men of the city shall stone him. Not just one particular group. No, 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 no. Come on. Everybody going to get a bite of this. Because we're going to send a clear message. All of y'all going to stone him with stones so that he died. Make sure he did. And you put the evil from amongst you. That's first. Number one, that behavior that they're, they're exhibiting, they said that this rebellious, stubborn, and will not obey, gluttonous, drunkard of a son of ours, all of those are sins. They're evilness. So you're allowing your child, if you're a churchgoer, you're allowing your child to exhibit sin. They're evil. Yahweh said, it removed this evilness from amongst you. That's first. First, you have to get, get in there, get the infected area, pull it out so that the infection don't spread. Remember the old adage, it only takes one apple to ruin the whole bunch. And this is the case right here. This is the case right here. Because with social media being what it is today, this ideology, these mindset, this behavioral issues, they are so prevalent because of social media. Children act out what they see. They gravitate towards what they are allowed to gravitate towards. So if they have no limits, no one there to challenge them, and they are able to gravitate towards these things, they learn it. They, it's learned behavior off of social media. This, this ain't going on in St. Louis and at the simultaneously going on in Oregon by happenstance or chance. Social media allows you to see everything. 
and this conduct and behavior, the reason it is an epidemic now because they are being able, it's being promoted on this platform and they're seeing it and it's not being challenged. Uh, uh, it's not being challenged appropriately. Put the evil away from amongst you and all of Israel shall hear and fear. That's the most important part of this. Not killing the kid. That's really, that's a real important part. But that all of Israel will hear and fear. See, once again, it goes back to instilling that fear into that child. Regardless of whether you say, oh, no, that's not good. You're traumatizing that child. Every child needs to be traumatized to a certain degree. Without that trauma, there is no fear. Without that trauma, there is no fear. If a child does not have that discipline in his life to traumatize him, as y'all call it, he does not understand. It is supposed to be promoted through hearing and fearing. Because this is the way that they're learning their behavior. They're learning this behavior on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. The same way, that same message that your child better behave itself. The message just wasn't for the child that a kid got killed because of his behavior. The message was for the parent as well. Because the parent took note to the fact that, boy, we'll kill a kid, man. And goes back to the proverb, you will save his life. If you, if you, if you beat your child, you will save his life. Because in Israel, and this is why we don't have these problems, because in Israel, if you don't discipline your kid, that's what's going to happen to him. If he becomes rebellious, he becomes out of, out of um, if he becomes rebellious, stubborn, um, he becomes just out of control like these kids are, boy, they'll bear him up to their neck and they'll deal with him real quick. But I have never, ever heard or read of an incident in our history where a child had to get the death penalty because the parents, the process, this is, this is our process right here. All them proverbs, all them, that's our process. That pressurization process started at home and it was pervasive throughout the community. So whenever the kid left the house, the neighbor had the same ability to discipline and pressurize, pressurize that child. If he was there, if he went down the street to the market, he was underneath that same pressurization. It took a village to raise children. So I just wanted to take a deep dive into that today, man, and uh, just talk about the male gene and, uh, you know, all this stuff, man. And, and, and I just love these topics, man. But like I say, man, this is the reason we don't have this in Israelite communities. This is a byproduct of feminist, the feministic movement because y'all didn't want a man in the home. You said you can raise children on your own and all of this, but you can't an act of discipline that a young black male needs in order to succeed, become who he needs to be, and be respectful of the authority outside of his home. So, man, I just wanted to hit this today, man, and I love this. And, man, I'm going to continue to do these things on the Backyard Chronicle, man. And, man, look, classroom chaos. Um, man, if you haven't liked and subscribed, go to like and subscribe, hit the bell for notification. I know this ran long, but there was no way that I'd be able to do a short work of it. Man, you know what it is. He Ron Van Malau coming at you with these Backyard Chronicles. Once again, like I always say, giving wisdom to the wise. And if you do not know how to think, I just gave you an opinion. 